we've put in the latest versions of the PowerPoints because I added a few slides and things to them. So will that be on, is that the right word? Will be on the server there, Anthony? Oh, I'm just about to put them in a Google Drive folder to share with you all for the last session when you're programming. So give me 15, 20 minutes. And but just a caution, if it, at, at the moment, if you could just share that within your own school, because uh, I just want them kept there for the moment. Uh, and then Anthony will give you further directions later on. And it's just, just because the in-service goes with it, and you, you can explain things to people in your own school as well. Uh, but as I said before, a lot of the strategies, uh, and just talking to uh, Fiona, um, who's still there, like a lot of these uh, will be relevant to K-6 to as well. So there's a couple of strategies. I'm just going to go through those. Uh, we'll go a bit longer. I'll finish at 1.55, and I'll go through resources as well. So I just wanted to refer that, you'll see this on the PowerPoint. So the second icon, and this is the reason why I referred to the theology of the icon before, uh, there's a number of great strategies some of you would have seen with um, Ron Richard's book and how authors making thinking visible. If you haven't seen that, that's a great strategies book. Uh, I put the reference uh, up there. So this is a method called Zoom In. And so it's, it's particularly good for the uh, Catholic liberal arts. Uh, so it's zooming in on an image in this case. And what I've suggested is uh, this is uh, the Virgin of Vladimir, probably one of the most famous religious artworks in the world. So the, the, the top scholars say. Uh, you can link this with, uh, say, the music of Hildegard. Uh, on Classic FM, there was a six hour Hildegard concert, so you can. Um, immerse yourself in that. But the uh, Ave uh, Mara Stella, uh, Hail Holy Queen, or Queen of the Sea, Mary of the Sea, <coughs> um, uh, you can use with that as well. Uh, and I'll put some other things about ritual. So this zoom in is where you use a part of the picture. So you're trying to pick something that the students haven't seen before, and you say, what is happening? This is only part of the picture. What is happening in this picture? And what do you notice about it? And what do you think is in the rest of the picture? I'm going to show it to you in three parts. <coughs> so they might make some comments about the eyes, uh, the comments that we made about the icons. Uh, what else is prominent in that image there that you can see just intuitively? Right, you've, still, you've got the long nose again. Uh, you've got her um, uh, mantle, there, there are specific uh, words in the icon for the clothing, but there's a star there as well which has significance in the icon. So they might talk about what's in the rest of the icon, if they don't know anything about Mary, they might not associate Mary and uh, the mother and child, the daughter and child. So some people might be able to guess from their knowledge uh, that there is a child there. So this is zooming in then zooming out. Once again, a lot of other comments, like it's a damaged icon. Uh, it's been used in many devotions. It's been fought over during wars. Uh, it's like the body of St. Francis. You know, St. Francis was, was wrestled over. And if you go to the Basilica in Assisi, he's buried down this great big pit with concrete over the top. And that's so people don't steal his remains. So he was in Assisi, but he'd be, be stolen by uh, Puglia or Spoleto or one of these other towns. Okay, so you might notice, um, uh, it's interesting, if you look closely, you can see the arm of the child around the Virgin's neck. So you can see there's the little fingers coming out from behind the, uh, the veil. Uh, the child's face is uh, full of light. Uh, it might be good, in terms of the teacher, to comment on the eyes of the Virgin, because they're, they're meant to be painted in such a way as they're not looking at you, they're sort of looking in inwards to her heart, this is a skill of the artist, but they're looking out beyond you to some other reality. So it's looking to the future of the Christ child, uh, if you like. So you can see that also the hands and the arms, I'm not sure if it's the wear and tear on the artwork, but they're different colours. Uh, but uh, the bottom hand is the same colour as the Virgin, so I suppose there's been uh, wear and tear there. And then you might comment on the clothes as well. Uh, for some people, the stars are symbolic of the Holy Trinity. So you can see the sun is one. Uh, the star is hidden there. <clears throat> mm. 
So Sister Wendy Beckett, there's a website I'll give you on her favorite religious images later on. But notice this, this idea that I started with, the apophatic and the cataphatic. We've got words, and sometimes we've got no words. So our human vocabulary falls short here. This is precisely what an icon strives to be, an intimation of the truth of heaven into which we are drawn as we contemplate. So it's not that we, you know, we're going to heaven because it's such a bad place. It's bringing heaven and earth together, on earth as in heaven, with the Lord's Prayer. So I've uh, mentioned that you can combine this with um, uh, uh, mantras. This is called the Eleusa or Eleusa style of icon. And it's because of our lady of tenderness, the tenderness between the mother and the child. And you notice they're almost breathing next to each other. The lips are next to each other. So it's this thing of intimacy. So what I thought I'd do is, we're trying to put these art words together, is put this next to um, uh, the Ave Maria sung by Pavarotti. And I want you to look between them. This is something I noticed just by playing it. It's really interesting just to look at him singing it. And it's just mastery of control. And uh, so I'll go past this. There's other, there's other things about the eyes and so on. Uh, so uh, Ave Maria by Franz Schubert. There's background there on that site. So I'll just forward this a little bit. But just look at Pavarotti's face and the face <coughs> of the Virgin. Very flourishing Italian style. getting into the emotion of the song as well. So my point is to listen to a, a version. Uh, that's the Latin. So you can sort of tell, even without knowing the Latin, uh, what they're emphasizing. You know, Marie uh, Grazia Plena, Mary full of grace. So they're obviously, they're emphasizing things in the song, not just because of the tune. But notice in the, at the end, they're repeating things that are important for their spirituality as well. Et in hora mortis nostra, at the hour of our death. Why do they repeat that three times? 
So the English is there as well. And then maybe go back to the gospel account. You see what I'm saying? It is interweave the different uh, levels of meaning, like when did it happen? And then go back, play it, and then go back to the icon. And what does all this say about the icon and the spirituality of the icon? And then start reading about that, read about the history. So there's different dimensions you can go into there. Uh, I've got something about images of Jesus. I've got a few there. And that one about whoever has seen me has seen your father, which is important for icons. So this learning experience three, I think your statement in the program, page 11, that we're not... Uh, we're looking at faith portraits, but we're not looking at a photo album. We're looking at statements of faith and a, like an art gallery. And almost like a diamond where you're looking at the different faces of the diamond. So something about these images. Uh, there was a fellow from the Aquinas Academy. There's a very famous lecturer called Doc Woodbury. And he used to say that God is like he, not he, more he which means that God is like something, God is like a mountain, let's, let's go back to the Virgin, God is like a mother, but God is not a mother, God is more than a mother. In other words, God is more than our human conceptions of that particular image. So that, that, that gives you the cataphatic side and the apophatic side. In other words, the image of God, or the mercy of God, for example, is bigger than we can ever conceptualise. It's bigger than a mother, it's bigger than a mother hen. It's bigger than our idea of justice. We've got a human idea. Okay, so a variety of them. The last strategy is a five or this is a PL strategy, a five or ten word poster. And then I think I'm going into um, some of the resources for your planning. So what I've suggested here is that you choose one comfortable portrait of Jesus and one uncomfortable, one that makes you uncomfortable, and you put some, some words around it. So I like this particular image here. We've, we've airbrushed Jesus white. So that they can collect images of Jesus. And the fact that he's not a Mediterranean Jew anymore is sort of made into a, um, uh, a white person or a white saviour. And you can look at the um, Jesus films. Okay, pick your top five or ten words to describe Jesus' titles or his qualities. Preacher, miracle worker and so on. Choose one portrait that is comfortable and one that is uncomfortable and challenging, such as Matthias Grunwald's crucifixion, which I've put on the next page. Put your five or ten words around these two portraits. It'll be interesting to see how this changes across seven to ten or even k to ten, uh, if they did the same exercise. And also look at the Cardinal Clancy Art Prize and see the variations there between the, uh, the different years. So this is one that a student might like, just an example. And then you can put, the intents might put words beside it similar to that. And this is a very confronting image. You can look at the basis behind Grunwald's one. Uh, I think it was in a leprosarium. So uh, Grunwald, it's part of a triptych, I think, and uh, he painted it uh, 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 so that it was in the context of lepers and other people who were recovering from various illnesses. So that the Christ was looking like the people who were seeking medical attention, who were sick, uh, who were dying, who had diseases. And so some of the, the uncomfortable sayings you might put there, some, uh, some things that uh, uh, might cause discomfort or what might not lead to Jesus being accepted. Uh, the other direction you can go, which I haven't got here, I think I've got another slide, is um, there are things called the texts of terror, and it's good for you as a teacher to look at them, like what are the texts that put you in question? You know, the difficult texts of Jesus. You know, Freud thought Jesus was mad. He said none of the things that he proposed would ever work. Like things like, you know, always forgive your enemies. If you're struck on the right cheek, turn the left. Don't invite your friends, invite outcasts uh, to your table. Uh, forgive 70, 70 times 7, 77 times 7, whatever he said. So these are the texts of terror. Uh, and even those who are building bigger barns all the time, there's texts of terror in the parable. So what are those? 
And I think we have to get students to look at those as well as the ones. It's not just the, the good shepherd or the one <coughs> with the children all the time as well. So, but I'd argue that the Jesus with the children is also a text of terror. There's two sides to it. You've got to become like a child. Just a couple of texts here. I put some classics of St. Augustine on Christ. So this is not some of the most more famous ones about God. Christ is not valued at all unless he is valued above all. And I put, put that beside that story of becoming a saint. So before, before Thomas Merton went into Gethsemane, Robert Lacks the Poet was saying, you know, it's not about being the best person you can, it's being a saint. Like your tradition is saying, that's, that's your full potential. And then the importance of humility. And then Catherine of Siena, I've got some other sayings. And she's got a very famous saying of Christ as a bridge. Like Christ is the bridge that we walk over the uh, uh, dark valley and walking upon Christ. So the bridge is the sun, the crucified sun. So that's Catherine's um, the dialogue, her famous work. And that's an image of Christ as the bridge over the abyss. So there's various images there. So you can do a lot with that work of art. There's, there's lots of different interpretations. Okay, there's one more thing. Yes, I've got, I've got a few more minutes. There's another one here that I want you to look at. It's from the Blake Prize that I mentioned. And I've put an image of Teresa of Avila, uh, which is called Teresa. So they haven't got the latest catalogue. You need to keep looking at the site for that. But uh, this is last year. Uh, the Blake Prize Religious Art 2021. So this is called Teresa, and it's by Anastasia Booth. That's the original by Benini. So it's an arrow piercing the heart of Teresa, who's in ecstasy. There's many different interpretations of the sculpture. But you might like to put that alongside the Song of Songs as well, because it was, uh, Teresa has this language of God as the lover who's coming to her. She wants to be close to Jesus. And Catherine of Siena is the same. And that's the other artwork from the Blake Prize. So she's obviously taking the arrow theme there. It'd be interesting to put those side by side and say, you know, what was Benini looking at? And uh, uh, what was the other uh, artist Anastasia Booth looking at? And then put that beside a prayer of St. Teresa. Uh, of being in the world, the statue of Christ with no arms. Christ has no body now but yours, no hands, no feet. You are the eyes through which he looks compassion on this world. So there's different ways you can link up this Teresa uh, image. Okay, uh, where to find resources? This will be on the PowerPoint when it comes through. I've listed some of these and I'll just uh, let you look at them. These are some of the the best ones, I'm thinking of year 10 because I want to save some of the other ones for 9, 8, 7. So these are the ones I think might point to them, but you can use some of them. Uh, again, you can look at some of these sites, we haven't had a chance to look at them. So you've got uh, Sister Wendy's favourite religious paintings, I think there's about 20 or 30 there. Uh, music, I've got Libra, Hildegard, uh, classical pieces of music, sacred music. For the God who sings on the ABC is an excellent one <coughs> for religious music. And he's introducing them and giving you the context all the time. Uh, the spiritual formation classics, um, as I said, be aware, wary of looking at sites because sometimes you can get like quotes that Augustine never said or Meister Eckhart or some of the others. So I would go to the text. And the one source I would take you to is Arthur Holder. It's worth getting a, a paperback or a, a hard copy. And he's got one called Christian Spirituality of Classics. So if you get a book by him or the one by Richard Foster listed there, then you've got some quotes from the classics. Uh, there's lots of good books that you'll find in, in Pauline books. Architecture, I've given you some sites there. Australian ones and overseas ones. Uh, if you look at the most interesting sculptures of all time, you'll often find religious themes there. Like it's not... It's not that some are religious and some are secular, it's crossing over all the time. Uh, and sometimes the sculptors don't even know it. Uh, literature. 
Uh, Brandon Vogt works for Word on Fire, so he's got a list of books. So people have done the work for you to look at some. I suppose the question is, what will I do with Year 7? Uh, year 7, I'm going to be ready for Flannery O'Connor, for example, or maybe even C.S. Lewis. And maybe it'll just be very simple texts, or it could be children's stories. Uh, but there are, there are some that are written there that they can have access to. Um, the Catholic Liberal Arts, uh, dance and opera is a bit more difficult, it's longer, but maybe you can use excerpts uh, from there. Church documents, other articles and insights. I've mentioned we had a discussion at lunchtime. Uh, C. Dakota, Emmanuel Garibay, the Filipino artist. He's got that unnerving one of the eye of God looking through the wound of Christ on the cross. So this eye is just looking at you. Uh, what, what does that mean? But if you see in the medieval illuminations, you'll notice that after Christ dies on the cross, that's when the Holy Spirit comes. So you've got the angels pulling the Holy Spirit out of the wound, and the church is born after the death of Christ on the cross. So you can see the church with the crown coming out of the wound after Christ has died. So that's how they taught medieval people about theology. So uh, they had some great insights. Uh, probably the last thing is, uh, you know, if you're worried about it, it's a classic, if it leads you to the information, I was just saying to Anthony, you know, see the code is one about the woman at the well, where they're both staring down the water. You could read the passage. You don't have to worry all the time about, oh, is this an absolutely rich and ditch classic? You know, is this the best of the best? If it's enabling you to have a conversation, maybe that's good to include, and include that with a number of other so-called classical paintings about the woman at the well, and put that in dialogue with the text. That might be a way to do it. But you've got to find something I would say in your programming that links the students to the topic. If you lose them when you're trying to teach them, if you're, for, if you're a mountain range away from them and they're not connecting with you, you've got to find something that connects with them first. I mean, you know this as teachers. Uh, otherwise, they're not going to go with you. So it's no use, no use showing them the Sistine Chapel if they don't understand the concepts that you're, you're trying to cultivate there. Okay, so we've got questions and work. Sorry for the speed I went through that, but I wanted to show you some um, aspects. Are there any any questions or comments before we start on the program? Just a few other ideas there. All those sources are there. I think that you think might might be up in the documents, the PowerPoints already. Or take I've just sent them. Okay, so it should be there. So you've got all those resources there. Any, I'll be. Going around the tables anyway, so. Um, but you should know each other well enough now to ask a few questions. You should be like best friends in this group. <laughs> so, is anyone, that's okay, we can go around to the tables. Are there any questions or comments before we, that you'd like the whole group to hear before we really, we're really going to individual tables? Or maybe at the end you might be able to get some yes. ideas or comments where people have discussed. I think this might be a nice opportunity if you wanted to start something off is to gather in networks and then perhaps after today if you still need to continue then you can uh, work together beyond this afternoon to continue to share resources. So if you'd like to do that as a suggestion please feel free to do so or stay where you are if you're more comfortable as well. But uh, if you want some help finding networks I'm happy to facilitate that too. Um, and, then, like. and just sort of the aim for this little period of time or be a good outcome that people could? I think if you could have at least um, an example of each of the examples, so something music, something art, something architecture in uh, your year 10 program as a rough goal. Um, certainly each of the learning experiences with maybe two liberal arts strategies, one to two liberal arts strategies in a learning experience. 